Hi, it's Robert Pires and uh, Deborah Meacock and Ahmed Mumtaz from Bias's offices on Reed Street in Hamilton, Bermuda. It is June 24, 2014. We have seen so far in 2014 a very good environment for equity investing. Global GDP growth appears to be turning up. In the U.S. specifically, the first quarter of 2014 saw a negative 1% GDP growth, but we believe this was weather-related. And, of course, the bad weather kept people out of the stores and also undermined the productive capacity of the economy. This probably created some pent-up demand, and so the projection is for the second quarter of 2014, which we are soon coming the end of which is expected to be up 3%. At the same time as very good economic growth, we are seeing U.S. retail price inflation to be declining, at just slightly over 1% in the most recent data that we have. So, year to date, we see the equity markets doing fairly well. Europe has been the star performer, up 6.16% to the 13th of June this year, followed close behind by the U.S. and emerging markets, which have been in a catch-up phase due to very good valuations. We've even got some positive performance from the bond market. So, in summary, stock and bond indices are all positive, and that is in spite of the fact that global stock markets as a whole have oscillated between gains and losses. Despite this oscillation, we see the S&P Global 1200 index up 4.12% to June 13, 2014. So, modestly good returns. The themes for 2014 that we are looking to highlight in this presentation are liquid natural gas infrastructure and natural and organic foods, um, that latter theme we've been involved with for at least a year and a half. So, Ahmed, um, let's talk about liquid natural gas. We sometimes slip into the abbreviation, which is LNG, but we're looking at liquid natural gas infrastructure. Talk to us about that. Sure. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so the, the first thing that we have here is uh, the growth of uh, liquid natural gas and the associated infrastructure with it. And we think that the primary driver for this team is that the U.S. natural gas production is expected to improve significantly uh, in the future. And we believe that a large contribution of that will come from shale gas. So why is that? Why, is, why are we seeing... Uh, this uh, uh, huge growth in uh, uh, natural gas. If you see the chart on the right that we have, the traditional uh, oil and gas assets that the U.S. had were in a declining trend. But over the last uh, decade or so, the U.S. has, through its innovation, made the shale assets that it has feasible, uh, economically feasible for, for production. And that's the green portion here in the chart. And we see that the incremental production that will come from the U.S. and from North America will be from those shale assets. So that's t a technological uh, innovation that is resulting in the economic extraction of gas from shale. That is correct. So where are we seeing this natural gas being used? Because it's a much cheaper source of energy than fossil fuels. Definitely. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's relatively cheaper to crude oil at the moment. And uh, certainly we see that as more supply will come online in North America, firstly, uh, there will be demand created internally in the U.S. And, in, uh, and we see that coming in from the industrial sector where they will benefit from the lower fuel cost of natural gas versus crude oil and its distillates. Also, we see that the power sector will, will gain from this higher natural gas production. Natural gas is considered clean energy, uh, and we have seen in the past that most coal-fired and diesel-fired uh, plants have converted to natural gas, and we see that trend continuing moving forward as well. So even this century, we've seen a huge increase in the use of natural gas by the electric power industry, and uh, that has uh, probably resulted from uh, the cheaper cost of it, but also uh, it's a much cleaner source of energy. So it's better for the environment. That's correct. It's clean energy. It's relatively cheaper uh, compared to distillates, coal, and diesel. Uh, 
so, and, and third area that we see, which hasn't picked up traction yet, but we see a lot of potential here is the transportation sectors. Companies with large fleets, even the rail sector in the US is considering to uh, moving and utilizing that high supply of natural gas that the country has. But that's fairly uh, modest growth in comparison to what is projected for the electric and industrial sector. Sure. There's an abundance of this natural gas. The US has the technology to extract it uh, very economically. Uh, what's going to happen to all this excess natural gas? So I think uh, while internal demand will increase in the U.S., I think even beyond that, there is enough supply that the U.S. will become a net exporter of natural gas heading into 2020, uh, as the data that we have here from the Energy Information Administration. What's, what's going to drive this? demand for U.S. Uh, natural gas exports? I think the primary reason we see, see from that is, uh, as the map indicates here, that there's a, there's a huge price variance of uh, natural gas and liquid natural gas across the globe. Uh, prices in the U.S. hover around 3 to $4 per MMBTU, MMBTU being a million British thermal units, which is a unit used for natural gas. As opposed to that, if you use, uh, if you move towards the east, uh, Japan, China, Korea, and even in Latin America, prices are around the range of 16 to $17 per MMBTU. So just that huge availability of supply and demand elsewhere in the world, and the price disparity because of that, will, will give opportunities to the U.S. to export this asset that they have. It's, it's almost five times more expensive in Japan than it is in North America. Uh, correct. It's it's also because these economies are high high growth economies, and also because they just lack the supplies of energy that the U.S. is gifted with. So, what drew our attention to this whole natural gas theme? So, I believe that the natural gas production story is a is a multi year story. It's a long term trend, but the recent geopolitical risk uh, from the Ukraine Russia crisis that happened put more urgency and emphasis on the situation, and. Uh, it created this urgency within companies and of countries to diversify their energy assets and to seek alternatives. You can see from the map here that uh, almost 40% of the natural gas imported by Europe is provided by Russia, and 66% of that transits to the Ukraine. So the geopolitical risk that happened earlier in the year between Ukraine and Russia involving Europe uh, put this urgency and need for companies and countries in Europe and the rest of the world to diversify their energy assets. So with respect to this anecdote, we have Europe for geopolitical reasons that needs this uh, cheap natural gas out of the U.S., um, but you have to get it from the U.S. over to Europe. So how do we facilitate that? Sure. So that brings us to our theme of infrastructure growth, because natural gas in its natural state uh, is is in, in, is in, is in gas, gaseous state. Uh, it takes up a lot of space, so it, it's, it becomes very inefficient and very cost ineffective to store it and transport it. Uh, there are LNG facilities and infrastructure facilities required to convert that gas into liquid, which takes up less space and becomes more cost efficient and easier to transport. And this is where our theme plays in, that as the US starts to produce more natural gas, its demand internally and demand for the rest of the world increases, there will be in, in LNG infrastructure facilities which ha will have to be built to store and to transit this asset. Some of these um, dots on your maps are blue. What does that indicate? Sure. So the map that we have here is uh, all the existing LNG sites that are, that are currently present. Uh, just to note here that uh, the U.S. was expected to be importing natural gas at one point, and now that, it, that it's become uh, relatively en energy independent, most of these LNG, LNG sites are being converted to be able to export natural gas. And the blue dots here indicate that these uh, sites will be offshore. Uh, they will be uh, offshore and in the water, actually. And that manages some of the risks that are associated with, uh, with LNG uh, transport. It also moderates the traffic of cargo in those areas. So the, 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 the main problem with transporting natural gas is that it's a very volatile substance. So safety is a consideration. And having these terminals offshore uh, accommodate um, uh, those safety issues. That is correct. Uh, and also, you can see from uh, these slides as you move on uh, that 
with the existing sites that they have, additionally, there are also approved LNG sites which are undergoing approval right now, regulatory approval. And you can see that there are further proposed LNG sites uh, uh, in the U.S. specifically and also in Canada. So it's, it's a North American story. It's a, it's a story that we see that there is a lot of traction. There is actual tangible assets on the ground of uh, LNG infrastructure growth already started. And we see huge momentum and huge potential in further growth of these LNG infrastructure sites. So what are we doing for our client portfolios to benefit from this natural gas infrastructure theme? So the stock idea that we have uh, is Chicago Bridge and Iron. Uh, this company uh, operates in the engineering and construction subsector of industrials and specializes in building LNG infrastructure projects. Uh, they can include LNG, oil and gas, power, refining, petrochemicals. Uh, and I think it's, it specializes in that area uh, and it, it will be key in gaining traction when this LNG infrastructure growth story uh, gains momentum. Okay. And um, it, that's a, a, an interesting name uh, because uh, it's uh, Chicago Bridge and Iron. Uh, is the company located in Chicago? Uh, no, the company actually started out from Chicago, but more recently it's domiciled in Netherlands. Uh, and the company has also, it has a long history of operating in the industrial sector. It's moved on from making bridge bridges and now it, it operates in this LNG and energy infrastructure uh, industrial space. The company is uh, a turnkey uh, provider, so it has the entire array of conceptualizing, designing, fabrication, and construction and actual maintenance of the project. Uh, just, just to mention, there has been a recent success for this company. It has won key contracts uh, year to date, which include the Cameroon LNG facility in Louisiana, Chevron's Wheatstone project in Australia, and K KNPC's Q clean fuel project in Kuwait. Okay, thanks, Ahmed. Let's uh, move on to natural and organic foods. We're seeing substantial growth in the sector, haven't we, Debbie? Very much so. Um, our initial entree in investing in this space was in Whole Foods. It remains the premier provider of natural and organic foods, and its own success has drawn in competition, which has put a little pressure on their profit margin. And so we have, for, for the time being, exited any exposure to Whole Foods and moved into the providers of the products that they're selling. And I think one of the things you'll see on this, on this first chart, and I think a very important word on here is mainstream. This is a trend that's been growing over a number of decades and is now gone mainstream. And I have some statistics that will help you see what I mean by that. Demand for organic food is, growing, um, is a growing trend in the U.S. And today, the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture has statistics that show 81% of U.S. families buy organic food at least some of the time. Now, organic food will be found in specialty stores and increasingly as a large department of a conventional grocery store. Forecasts today are calling for 14% compound annual growth from this year, 2014, over the next four years to 2018, and that's unbelievable for a staple industry. Organic food production in the U.S. has, has already increased 240% from 2002 to today, which again is phenomenal growth. So what, what's driving all this? So one of the, some of the trends behind natural and organic foods is avoidance of some negative things such as pesticides, genetically modified organisms, artificial colors, stabilizers, coloring, and antibiotics and chemicals being used in the industry. And we found more and more reasons for health consciousness to be eating more normal and natural food. So we're seeing a, a lot of uh, buy-in by conventional grocery stores to this theme of organic and natural food. I think we've all experienced it. And it, the, the statistics are f unbelievable, really. 75% of, con of conventional grocery stores today also offer natural and organic foods. Those sections are growing. One of the big announcements this year is Walmart is going into natural and organic foods in a very big way. There are 20,000 natural food stores in the United States that offer uh, natural and organic food. Now. Definitions get a little difficult here, but natural foods are generally seen to be minimally processed with very few manufactured additives as a simple definition. Organics have limited synthetic inputs as well, such as pesticides and chemicals. 
Organic farmers also focus on um, doing things that will be good for the environment. They focus on conservation of water and soil that they're not harming the earth where these uh, natural products are coming from. And we're looking for a really huge growth in this uh, sector. It is expected to grow at an 82% rate. That would be from 2010 to 2015 to a rounded number of a hundred and five billion dollar market. Okay, so we're out of Whole Foods. We got out of our final position at the beginning of this year. Um, not to say that we wouldn't go back to it at some point in the future. Uh, it's just that um, you know the growth projections on that stock have to be adjusted downward, and hence the valuation of the stock has fallen. Um, so we've gone upstream to benefit from those producers of organic and natural foods. I would think that perhaps since this data was produced on the previous slides that close to 100% of stores are providing natural and organic foods. So tell us about these companies that are producing natural and organic foods. So the two companies we've chosen to invest in are Haynes Celestial and White Wave Foods. The, you're not going to see their name. They're the manufacturer, but we do have some names of the products that they develop. So, so they're producers of natural and organic foods, um, but we've also gone into a restaurant chain that is, uh, I think of it as, as, as fast food organic. Exactly. Chipotle Mexican Grill, which is a very popular casual dining restaurant in the United States, focuses on delivering natural foods at a reasonable price and has been extremely successful and is growing. So let's look at some of these uh, brands because um, I, I think many of us are buying them and not really thinking about the fact that they're natural and organic. Um, there are, some of us are very, very focused in only buying organic, and some of us are organic and natural. But I think that would be surprised at some of these brand names because I recognize that I buy several of these brand names but never ever thought about them being organic or natural. So White Wave Food is very interesting in that they are focused on plant and nut-based dairy products, which is a huge growing category. And I'm sure most of you have seen this when you go to the grocery store. The Silk line, we're talking about almond milk. Rice. Rice the milk. Flax. Yes. They have hemp milk, which is interesting. But all plant-based milk milks, which a lot of people are converting to because you have this lactose intolerance you know, that some people have. But generally, it's considered to be more healthy. I'm not lactose intolerant, but I have started buying these plant-based milks. One of the things I find is that they tend not to spoil as quickly as regular milk. Tell us about Hain Celestial. This seems to be more food-based. Hain has been around developing and producing natural foods for many years. They bought Celestial Seasoning, which is a natural tea developer, and they have been growing through acquisition. And you'll see that they're in many categories. You would never know that's the name of the company that's, that's providing this. They're in the Greek yogurt business, which we all know is a growing area. We'll see that in our own grocery stores. Imagine, which is natural and organic soups and broths. Spectrum, which is oils, vinegars, and and condiments, also all natural. One that's been around a long time is Arrowhead Mills, all organic baking products. Nile does soup cups. I think another one in here I find personally rather interesting is Earth's Best. It's one of the first organic lines for infants, and there is a very large trend in giving children natural food when, while they're developing, which I think is really interesting. Now, now both of these companies are spin-off from traditional food companies. If we turn to the next page, we see that Haynes Celestial is a spin-off from Heinz, and that White Wave is a spin-off from Dean. Now, why would they have uh, spun off these companies? The reason they did is they were growing faster than their core businesses, and they had higher profit margins. So in order to get the advantage of that, they've spun them out as what we would call a pure play. And that is indeed what's happened. These categories are growing much faster and buying more products. And so it's been a very successful strategy. This is a complicated chart, but all the little green circles show you the natural and organic pieces that are being spun out of conventional food providers, which I think is still very interesting. So to summarize, this is um, organic has gone mainstream and many of us haven't even thought about of it, about it, and we are actively participating. So, of course, higher growth is expected to give higher profits um, for our clients and for our portfolios. 
So thank you very much, Ahmed and Debbie. Thank you for those of you that have tuned in to listen to the latest with respect to our strategy. We'll be back to you in the months to come as we update our themes and provide more uh, and new ideas uh, to help your portfolios profit. All the best to you till then. Have a great summer. <music>